Welcome to Funded TV, your source for the latest crowdfunding and crowdsourcing news, events, and interviews with the experts. To begin this episode, we'd like to offer our condolence and support to the victims of the recent bombings in Boston. This tragedy has inspired strangers to use crowdfunding to support those they've never met. Friends use crowdfunding to collect more than one million for Boston Marathon victims' medical expenses. Hundreds of strangers have got their backs. Donors are going to sites such as GoFundMe, Give Forward, Fundraiser, You Caring, and Fundly to contribute to victims' medical and personal expenses, including helping to pay for pricey operations and making homes accessible to those who have lost limbs. Social media drives crowdfunding websites into the news feeds of thousands of strangers across the world. The websites usually take 5-12% to cut from the donations as a fee for their service. Give Forward estimates that people raised more than $2.8 billion through online crowdsourcing in 2012. Crowdfunding is an increasingly popular phenomenon where individuals from all over the world contribute their capital to projects, innovations, inventions, businesses, nonprofits, and charities. You may be familiar with Kickstarter.com or Indiegogo.com, where the famous Pebble Watch received over $10 million on Kickstarter and the Veronica Mars film brought in $1 million in four hours and closed with $5.7 million. There are four types of crowdfunding, rewards-based including pre-sales, donations-based, lending-based or debt, and equity-based, which is not yet legal in some countries. On April 5, 2012, Obama signed the JOBS Act and mandated the Securities Commission to come up with a legal framework for equity crowdfunding. To date, crowdfund investing is not yet fully operational in the U.S. and Canada. We are advocating to change that. In a sluggish economy, crowdfunding is having an energizing effect, spreading optimism. Small investors through crowdfunding are complementing traditional venture capital, stimulating economies and raising funds from new technological devices that make the world better and create employment to funding art, film, publishing ventures, apps and computer games. Crowdfunding is significantly changing the way people invest. On today's show, we welcome our first two guests, Mary Jutton and Andre Minkoff, to talk about intellectual property and crowdfunding. Mary Jutton is the CEO and founder of Tracklight.com. Tracklight.com is an online consulting software tool that allows inventors, creators, and businesses to identify intellectual property and provides a plan to secure that IP at a fraction of the cost normally paid to an in-person provider. Welcome to the show, Mary. Well, thank you very much, Joy, for having me today. Mary, why should I care about IP before I crowdfund? You should really care about IP before you crowdfund because once it's out there, it, it's your whole idea is out there on the internet no matter what kind of crowdfunding you're doing so if there's anything that you want to keep secret you should do it before you start your campaign what you should do first is you need to figure out what you have and you need to think of your idea and decide whether is it something I'm just gonna try to keep secret like keep a piece of it secret or is it something I'm gonna patent and so you need to identify the what first Right. And there needs to be a balance between figuring out what you want to keep secret and you need to identify what you have. So the best way of figuring out what you have is you would need to look at it from a generic point of view. Don't jump to the point of, oh, I need to go talk to the lawyer about my patent. You need to start from the very beginning. What do I have? Get all your papers together, your business, whether it's your business plan, your videos, anything that you might have already protected. And you need to look at all of that and decide what is your IP strategy or your plan. And in order to do that, you need to know, first of all, what kind of IP that I do you actually have. And how can Tracklight help me with that? Well, what Tracklight does is Tracklight has a TurboTax tool that you would gather all those papers and then you would actually walk through a set of questions and then at the end you'll get a report that tells you all of your potential intellectual property. Great. Well, crowdfunding isn't yet legal in Canada and the U.S., so why should I care now? Well, the thing is, crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding isn't yet legal in Canada and the U.S., but you can get prepared for any kind of funding, any kind of um, pitching. And in addition, once the SEC in the US gets the rules out there for all of us to use, it's not an overnight. It's not as simple as 
launching a Kickstarter campaign where you record a video in your garage or your in your um, in your driveway and then throw it up. There's a lot of regulations that we know will, will be in the U.S. law, and you know, including having audited financials, depending on the size of what you're trying to raise, having an evaluation, background checks. So part, part of that is having an online business plan, which will include your intellectual property, but will include all the details also of your um, of your business. So doing all that will take time. So the time is now to start getting prepared for crowdfunding. Mary, I know you've had a lot of interesting experiences with your clients and many success stories. Please let us know one of your most recent success stories. I've had a couple of success stories where I've had people come to me before they launched a Kickstarter campaign and talk a little bit about, you know, oh, I'm going to put the drawings up and I'm going to put the picture up on Kickstarter. But recently in September, Kickstarter changed their rules, so you're not allowed anymore to just put up a picture of what you're doing. You actually have to display how it works. So before this person was going to put up a campaign where he would disclose what his product was and how it worked, which in the U.S. that means you've now, you know, you you've now disclosed it to the world. It might impact your ability to patent um, outside of the U.S. Instead of throwing it out there, we took the time to walk through what. IP he might have and the concern was two things one of them was the concern that he did want to pursue a patent so he needed to go speak to somebody about his patent before he put it on Kickstarter and the second was he needed to make sure and this is a common thing with inventors they get very excited about their invention and then they forget about the name of the invention so you want to make sure that you're not infringing on somebody else's name when you have that name so uh, we were able to prevent him from giving away his idea and starting all kinds of clocks running and, and what could have ended up not well by just sitting down and talking to him before he did his campaign. Great. And what other experience you've had with another client? Well, it, an interesting experience I had with one client that used Tracklight was she had gone on and put in a bunch of information about her business. And she had not realized that just getting the URL, so she got the domain name, that didn't give her any kind of naming rights. So she was in the process of ordering all kinds of marketing materials. So she was able to, to stop that, make sure that the name was okay, which it was not. So she had to adjust her name, change her logo, and come up with something that would not infringe on a rather large other organization, which you don't ever want to do. So it's just really, it all gets back down to planning and identifying first. Um, sticking your head in the sand with intellectual property is really not a good idea, but as a startup or somebody who's really excited about crowdfunding, you kind of want to get started. It doesn't take very long to take that step to identify first, so then you're making an informed decision about your IP. Well, thank you for all the help that you provide to crowdfunders. It's been great to have you on the show today. I'd like to direct our listeners to tracklight.com. That's T-R-A-K-L-I-G-H-T.com. And learn more about how Mary can help you with your IP. Andre Minkov, pleasure to have you in studio today. Andre earned his PhD in law in Russia with a dissertation on international protection of intellectual property and shortly after joined Baker & McKenzie, the largest international law firm. There, he became the single point of reference for all matters concerning copyright law and domain name disputes. Over his career, he has helped composers, designers, book writers, including J.K. Rowling, film companies ranging from small ones to DreamWorks. He's also helped Sony, Motorola, Porsche, and Ford, perfumery and skincare companies, including Amway, L'Oreal, Mary Kay, and countless number of other clients. As a lawyer who understands his clients, he has saved them tens of thousands by providing clear, simple, and logical solutions to their problems. Connect with him at MinkovLaw.com. Andre, what would you recommend to entrepreneurs who decided to tap into crowdfunding yet are concerned about IP? Well, they should be first deciding about crowdfunding and then thinking about IP. That's the wrong order. It's like saying, I really want to take this trip on a train, yet I have to figure out how to get to Europe. It doesn't work that way. First, you have to figure out where you're going and then see if the vehicle you chose is going to get you there. So same thing with IP. First, you figure out what's your IP strategy, 
If you have to figure out what it is that you need to protect for your business to survive or, and become profitable, and then see if you can accomplish that through crowdfunding. You have to figure out if crowdfunding fits the strategy, not the other way around. How do you start building an IP strategy without a big budget? Well, it's one of my favorite questions, really, because unlike what most lawyers and law books are going to have you believe, there are only two types of IP. The IP that comes in your door and the IP that goes out of your door. The IP that comes in your door is really what you create, what you have others create for you, what you buy from other people, and what you steal from other people. So out of all of that content, you should identify the content without which you would have no business. And then you have to look at the IP that goes out of your door, and that is the IP that you sell to other people or that, that you're afraid that other people may steal from you. Again, look at all of that and see uh, what IP, if stolen, would leave you without a business. So once you've identified all that, that's the good time to go see a lawyer and ask them a question. Look, I know that this is something that I really must protect. How do I do that? And when you have that focus, when you have the strategy, first of all, it will make it a lot easier for your lawyer to help you, and it will make it a lot easier for you to build a business that works. Yeah, so if you're crowdfunding, does that mean you're going to have non-disclosure agreements with thousands of crowdfund investors? Having to enter into thousands of NDAs does not seem like a good idea. And when you're crowdfunding, essentially, yes, you do have uh, a lot of agreements with everybody who's participating, but the contract is only as good as your ability to enforce it. So with when you're having an NDA with a big company, uh, you know that if they are in breach of it, at least you can take them to court and get something out of it. When you have an NDA with people around the world, most of which don't have a lot of money, that kind of makes you think, is that a good idea or not? So when you're crowdfunding, you should only disclose something that you would be okay with other people disclosing to the whole world, because there's gonna be no way for you to actually enforce the NDA, however strong it is. Thanks, Andre. Please highlight a few success stories. I've been blessed to have a lot of success stories over more than 15 years of my legal career. It goes back to when I had a client who was a film director and uh, he was fighting with a producer. And the funny thing was that the director owned, owned all the rights to the film. The problem was he didn't have the film because the film was physically owned by the producer. And so we had a great situation. The, the director had the rights, but no film. The company had the film, but no rights. And uh, they were literally about to burn the film because uh, they couldn't figure out how to, how to work together. And they, that was probably one of the worst hatreds I've seen between a producer and a director. So instead of allowing them to go to court and fight over a movie that was about to be burned, I figured out that they both wanted the, the movie to go out there. So what I came up with is an idea that they formed a partnership uh, whereby my client contributed the IP and the, the other company and the, and the company contributed the film and so they were able to figure out a way to release it. And it was probably one of the funniest partnership agreements because a partnership agreement presumes that people at least respect each other. It was nothing like that in the partnership agreement. They hated each other's guts but they were able to accomplish what they were trying to do. And really it's all about strategy. Uh, when you have a strategy where you know where you want to go, you are able to find a solution. And the other story I wanted to share is, in fact, my personal story. Two years ago, I thought I invented an amazing novel way to deliver books to lawyers. And I'd be using it right and left. Nobody is doing anything like that still. And I was over the top happy. And not being a patent agent, I tried doing a patent search myself and found absolutely nothing. And I was about, I, I was really ecstatic and thinking, wow, that's my source of passive income for the rest of my life. I'm just super great. And I was about to pay over $20,000 to file patents in Canada and the US. And mind you, two years ago, I didn't have a spare $20,000. And uh, then I told myself what I always tell my clients to do, think about the strategy. And then I realized that getting a patent is something without which the idea was completely unmonetizable. So the next thing I did, I asked myself a question, is there a way to test this idea at a smaller extent, at a smaller expense without having to pay $20,000?
Long story short, I found a patent agent in the US, uh, whom I still use today all the time, who conducted a proper patent search for me and came up with a 90 page report that effectively buried my idea. Uh, it's sad because the idea didn't go anywhere, but I'm happy that I saved myself over $20,000 in the long run. So again, strategy is everything. So there you have it, our experts weighing in on crowdfunding and crowdsourcing. Funded TV is proud to host our next guest, Scott Harrison, a local Vancouver resident who is passionate about growing the economy and sustainable practices. This is an exciting and busy time for Scott Harrison as he is an MLA candidate for the BC Liberal Party in our current election in the West End. Scott has 15 years of entrepreneurial, business and political organizing experience with a passion for land development backed by a degree in Canadian history. His diverse background is centered on entrepreneurship, hard work and leadership with a solid understanding of complex political processes. So Scott, how do you see crowdfunding potentially benefiting small businesses? Well, I think that uh, from what I know of crowdfunding, uh, I think that the opportunity with it for small businesses is that it gives them the ability to attract potentially a larger pool of small retail investors. I think the bigger concern that a lot of folks would have around crowd uh, source funding for business ideas is the protection for investors themselves. So I think once they can kind of figure out that uh, critical piece of the puzzle, I think that there's a lot of great opportunity for small business owners or medium-sized business owners that want to grow their business and need a way to access um, capital. What is your vision for responsible government? Well, to me, it's pretty simple. I mean, the Canadian Constitution is clear. Peace, order, and good government is the objective of government in Canada. Uh, a responsible government, in my mind, is a government that listens to the people and balances its budget. It doesn't go and create programs that we can't afford in the future. It doesn't go and create spending obligations that future generations are unable to pay for. That, in my mind, is what a responsible government is. They're responsive and they live within their means and they don't saddle future generations with debts and bills that they can't afford. Tell us about a community project that serves as an example for what you believe in. Well, my idea is pretty simple, is that downtown Vancouver, we really need more high school spaces. The current high school, which is for all of downtown, has been around for 20 plus years and it's been full. So it's over capacity and there's a ton of growing, sustainable families downtown. So my idea is twofold. One, to build on the Olympic legacy of the games, and two, to build a local high school. So the idea is to build a high performance sports and arts based high school right in downtown Vancouver. So the idea is we bring world class young athletes into a regular high school setting, similar to that, to that famous school in New York that uh, the movie Fame was based on. That's the idea. Uh, the name I would love to give it is Art Phillips High School because Art Phillips made downtown urban sustainable walkable living possible for my generation and future generations. So it just seemed like a fitting tribute for him. So the idea where, you know, crowdsource funding for foundations or for charities, it could work in this case because if enough of us cared and could see the beginning of the idea, we could create a full and robust business plan. We could connect with logical partners like the Canucks, the Lions, the Whitecaps, the VSO, you know, every major arts group that's around. And hopefully, by doing that, we can create a robust business plan that we can then go to the province and go, hey, on top of a regular school, let's add this, and it's a win for everybody. Scott, I love the Art Phillips High School plan, and I anticipate things will start happening very soon with how things are going right now. Could you please share with us a situation from your own life that's impacted you to pursue your current goals as a Liberal candidate? Generally, my parents, when they raised me, they said, do things you love and give back to your community. And those are the two things that I really grew up with. So as I've I did a degree in Canadian American history and I've been an entrepreneur and I've been a father and actually I had the benefit of being a stay-at-home parent as well. So I think that diverse set of backgrounds has really put me in a place where now I said, you know, it's time instead of just tweeting about it or posting on Facebook about it, instead of just being behind the scenes and supporting good candidates, 
that I decided I would be a candidate. This is not a new thing for me. I've always dreamed of running for office since I was a paper boy, delivering papers in Vancouver and reading about current events and going, gee, I'd love to influence or shape those. And so now this is my chance to do that. And I'm really excited about running. I'm excited about being a free enterprise voice that believes in balance. And I'm really excited that we have a physical conservative, conservative leader who says we need to live within our means and we need to lay the foundation to ensure our kids don't inherit a big pile of debt so they have options when they get into power. In the 21st century, after we've got our fundamentals correct, we need to find ways to raise capital in new ways that reflect the new realities of what we've created. So building upon the successes, learning from our mistakes, ensuring we protect investors while at the same time saying to the entrepreneurs and innovators, here's another tool in your toolbox you can use to raise money because without private sector investment, we have nothing. Without private sector investment, we don't have goods and services that we need in society, those being services we enjoy like an iPhone or things like healthcare and education that are public goods in our, in our country that we need to pay for. And we pay for those things by a growing and thriving private sector economy. Crowdfunding, crowdsource funding may be an opportunity that works for us to raise money for good new ideas. We have challenges with any new idea, but if they're not insurmountable and if they can find a way to make it possible that we can raise money for equity markets through this, I think that would be a great innovation for our economy. Those of you that care about free enterprise, those of you that care about unsexy things like balanced budgets and making sure that our kids aren't left with debt, I encourage you to get involved in this election, to make sure that you contribute in this election that you vote at a minimum, that you talk to your friends, you talk to your employees, you talk to your suppliers, because this election is not over until all of you had have, have had your say. So I think it's critically important that as we move forward in this election, that we lay the foundation for a debt-free future for the next generation. That's my kids, that's your kids, that's your niece, that's your grandchildren, that's your nephew. We need to make sure that we pay it forward to them because they need the opportunities that a debt-free province will provide them. We need to grow the economy through private sector investment, and crowdfunding can certainly be part of that. Funded TV is pleased to announce the launch of its sister site, www.anideanation.com. An Idea Nation is an emerging social network serving as partner to government. An Idea Nation invites businesses and individuals all over the world to collaboratively solve global challenges within eight global priorities. Be one of the first to contribute and experience the joy of crowdfunding. Until next time, happy crowdfunding, and may you be inspired to contribute to a brighter future for all of us who share this planet. This is Joy Case, your host from Funded TV. See you next time.